Friends, we gather together today for worship with heavy hearts, hearts breaking for those who fear for their lives, hearts breaking for those who are mourning today. Anxious as it feels like our entire world has shifted in the last few days. And yet, our God has not changed. And he is present with us in joy and in sorrow, and God is present with us in the midst of the chaos and the anxiety that has gripped our hearts today. And so we come to entrust our very lives to God, to strengthen one another as we continue this good work of joyfully sharing God's boundless love. Whether you are joining us online or in person today, it is an honor to be with you. And I pray that you encounter God's love in a powerful way in the time that we have together today. would invite you now to prepare your hearts for worship with our call to worship, which is on the bulletin or in the screen. You're welcome to say the words in bold out loud. Holy One, dwell within us. Whisper in our ears. Glimmer in our vision. Write upon our hearts. We wait with open ears, open eyes open hearts. Amen. I invite you to stand if that is comfortable for you. together, I invite you to read your response in bold that's up on the screens behind me. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. We look not to the mountains or valleys, even heaven or earth, for God is found among us. Wherever two or three are gathered in Christ's name, God is here among us. Come, let us worship the God of creation, the God of people, the God of community. Let us follow Jesus, for Jesus is the way. Let us worship together in faith. Amen.
had a professor in seminary who would say that when he was backed into a theological corner, uh, he would quote a hymn. And so today I'm going to lean on the line that we just heard from that hymn, um, Jesus as Ruler of the Nations. Um, and in the meantime, we have uh, lots of life and work that we continue to do here among our community. So I want to tell you about some of those things that we're doing. Um, first of all, the, uh, this Wednesday, the season of Lent begins. A season of prayer, a time to prepare for renewal. And you're invited to come to the Ash Wednesday service, um, which is Wednesday night at 6, six o'clock. <laughs> I forgot. It's at 6 o'clock. Um, so you are all invited to come. Um, if you plan to attend online, um, but you, and you would like to get some ashes, you can pick them up in the church office. Um, we would love to provide those for you so you have them at home. We also have some um, prayer cards for you out in the lobby if you want to pick them up. They have um, breath meditations on them. So a, a sentence that you say when you breathe in and a sentence that you say when you breathe out. Um, and there's four different breath meditations on those. So that might be a practice you might be interested in engaging for the season of Lent. Um, this Saturday, I understand that there is some important garden work that is going to be done um, starting at 7 a.m. So if you have a truck that you can haul compost in, you, that means that dirt will be shoveled into it, or you are a resident of Clovis, um, your help is needed. And you can um, just tell Ren today if you are available to help or Bob um, Barand is another person who is helping to coordinate that. And then one more. Um, we have four meal trains going right now for new babies that are connected to this community. Four. So much new life. So many um, parents and households at home with uh, sleepless nights um, needing help with food. Um, so we are in need of additional help, even if this isn't something that you normally do. Um, we would love to have your help dropping off meals. You can also send a gift card directly from the Meal Train website. So all of these are found at upcfresno.org slash meal train. But you won't remember that, so just look at the bulletin or go to the last UPC email um, for that. And with that, <laughs> We shift to hearing from the Word of God, and I know that today I, I am ready for that. So let's pray for a moment together um, as we prepare to hear how God is speaking to us this morning. God, we bring ourselves and all that is in us to you today. We especially ask you to inhabit the body, the words, the voice of our pastor, Wren, as she shares with us what's on her heart this morning. Amen. Before being called here to Fresno, I served at a small church in a small town in Massachusetts. And there was another church in town that all the other churches aspired to be. It was the it church in town, and it was a newer church. It met in a warehouse. It had fog machines and spotlights. I'm sure you've heard of churches that are similar to this. It was growing like crazy. It's where all the young families were going. It seemed like they were doing great things in the community, um, and we all really um, were a little envious of what they were doing. But I was caught off guard when I learned that in order to become a member or to volunteer or to serve in leadership, that people were required to sign a covenant saying that they would give 10% of their income to the church, that they um, would, would sign a document promising to tithe. There's something that sits a little funny with me, tying this beautiful act of discipleship with the ability to belong as a part of God's people. On one hand, I think generosity is a wonderful way for us to grow in our faith. It's something that the Bible talks about a lot. There's a biblical basis for this idea of a tithe, that we're supposed to give 10% of what we have to God. And the 
people of God have this wonderful tradition that started in the Old Testament of giving their first fruits to God each year. And it's something that a lot of churches still lift up as an important biblical practice. There's something that just sits a little wrong with me about requiring this in order to belong with the people of God. It seems to lack grace and, and goes against Jesus' teachings of, of welcoming and inviting all people to God's table. And ever since I heard this, I never quite thought of that church in the same way and had a much better understanding of how they were able to afford such beautiful buildings. I know many of us have some baggage around this idea of money in the church. Whether you grew up in a church that treated money legalistically or harshly, or whether you are newer to church and you've just observed um, some of these mega pastors who have amassed riches that I can't understand, we all sit a little funny when it comes to talking about faith and money. There's a lot of examples of churches that have gotten this wrong. And so for those of you who have some baggage around the idea of a tithe, I have some good news and some bad news for you today. The good news is that Jesus never told us that we were supposed to tithe. Wonderful. The bad news is that Jesus told us we were supposed to give everything to God. <laughs> and that's a little harder to wrap our heads around. So I want to invite you to hear Jesus talk about money to a man that he encountered who came to him with everything but knew he was lacking something. So hear firsthand what Jesus has to offer us today. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt beside him, and he asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And the man said to him, teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we've left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and fields with persecution, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who will, are first will be last, and the last will be first. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Jesus talked about money a lot. And nothing that Jesus had to say about this subject was easy. 288 verses in the Gospels are about money. That's one in ten verses. A tithe of verses, if you will. It's the same pattern we see in the Bible as a whole. Jesus talked about prayer for five, or the Bible talks about prayer for 500 verses. But a whole 2,000 verses are dedicated to how we interact with money and material wealth. Why is it that the greatest man of all time spent more time talking about money than anything else? I think it's because money matters. Not just because when we share our resources that we get to help build God's kingdom out in the world, but because money matters to us, to our own souls that it's so very hard to trust God fully 
when we allow our possessions to dictate how we live in this world. It's why this man went to Jesus, longing for direction. And when Jesus told him that what he had to do was give away what he had, he left sad because he knew he just couldn't do it. And not that he didn't want to, this was a faithful man. We're told that he had kept the commandments, that he had dedicated his life to following God. He was blessed in the eyes of the world. There was no reason for this man to be discontent. And yet he knew there was something lacking, whether that was depth or healing or community. He wanted more from life than riches and righteousness. And so he went to Jesus and he asked what he needed to do in order to inherit eternal life. And Jesus quotes him the Ten Commandments, or, or actually he quotes him the second half of the Ten Commandments, the half that has to deal with loving your neighbor. And the man said he had done this well, and Jesus agreed with him. He indeed had been a good neighbor, and yet something was still lacking. And so Jesus questions his very devotion to God. That while he might have succeeded in maintaining the letter of the law, he had missed the intent behind it entirely. That he had placed his faith in his wealth and his riches. And by doing so, he broke the first commandment of putting money before God. And Jesus looked into his soul and saw that money had become his entire life, his sense of safety, his comfort, his position in life. Somewhere along the line, he had allowed his riches to lure him into this false sense of security. And he stopped relying on God for his very life. And so Jesus upped the ante, as he so often does, and he looked at this man with love. And he says, it's not enough to give just a tenth of what you have. You must give it all. And the man just couldn't do it. He went away empty-handed, and he missed the gift that he so desperately desired. And Jesus tells his disciples that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. The disciples were appalled and said, then who can be saved? And Jesus says, for man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. And that's the rub. There's nothing we can do to receive this gift that God is offering us, because it is just that, a gift. And the man was accustomed to doing, but he couldn't just be with God. Now think about it. Children don't have to do anything to receive their inheritance besides wait around for a while. An inheritance is the, the right of all children. It's the gift of our parents born out of love. And it's the same with the gift of grace that God has to offer to us. And while we don't have to do anything to earn this gift, God doesn't offer cheap grace. That there's something about us that needs to shift in order for us to experience the riches that God has for us, not only when we die, but right here and right now when our hearts long for it the most. This man had everything, money, religious piety, power, and respect, and yet he found himself wanting. And Jesus said he lacked just one thing. He found his life empty because he trusted in what he owned instead of trusting in God. And so Jesus says, what you need is to be freed from the things that hold you from God to let go of your wealth and your possessions and your security, to let go of your safety net, and to believe that God will care for you. And the truth is, money turns our hearts inwards, and it allows us to think more highly of ourselves than we should, and to pretend like we don't really need God. And it can leave us feeling empty and alone. That's why Jesus says it's so hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God because they can't free themselves from the grip that wealth has on us. And don't be fooled, we're all rich. We might think that, you know, we're not the 1%, or that budgets have been so much tighter than they usually are, so this doesn't apply to us. 
But as one pastor so eloquently puts it, whoever has enough to be afraid to lose it is rich. That is all of us. It begs the question, what do we lack in terms of our relationship with God and wealth? Do we lack a generous heart or a concern for the poor? Do we lack trust in God's provision? Or do we have trouble living in the here and now? How has money taken root in your heart and created a wall between you and God? You know, when we try to do things on our own, when we use our own power and strength to earn our place into God's kingdom, we too are like a camel trying to fit through the eye of a needle. And we miss out on the abundance that God has for us. And perhaps that's why it's easier for a poor person to receive God's gifts. They have less stuff and less ego and less self-reliance. They're able to more quickly recognize their need for God. You know, as somebody who follows the rules and tries to do things the right way, Jesus' command to sell everything doesn't sit right with me. It's not how the world is supposed to work. You know, I've, I've done the right things. I've gotten a job. I've saved. I'm careful with my money. And Jesus tells us to give it away. It goes against every fiber of my being. And yet it's precisely why Jesus talked about money so much. Because our relationship with money impacts our very souls. It's at the core of our faith. It teaches us something about our relationship with God when we look at how we use our resources. And the practice of generosity helps us grow in our faith as we learn to entrust God with all that we are. That's why Jesus invites us not to just give a portion of what we have, but everything that we have to God. To let go of our safety net, to force us to rely on God's good love for us doesn't mean that Jesus is literally calling each and every one of us to sell our houses and get rid of our bank accounts. There's plenty of examples in the New Testament of faithful people who had riches and wealth and who loved Jesus well. But the point is that our whole heart should belong to God. That all that we are should be given to the sake of God's kingdom here in this world. And for me, one of the best spiritual practices to grow in this has been the discipline of generosity. This practice of intentionally giving away some of my resources for the sake of my neighbor, for the sake of myself. It helps to retrain our relationship with money and to trust more fully in God. The act of generosity is one that's deeply meaningful to me. And it took a long time to develop Generosity isn't something that came naturally to me, and I would imagine doesn't come naturally to most of us. But giving away some of my resources aligns me with God's truth, that what I have is for my benefit and for the benefit of my neighbor, and that it is ultimately God who cares for me and not my bank account or the resources that I have amassed. The best way that I have found to do this is to intentionally build money into my budget each month because generosity doesn't happen on accident. If you wait to give God whatever is left over, there's rarely going to be anything left over. The Old Testament commands God's people to give 10% of their resources to God. But this is a, a guidepost. It's not a law. And it reminds us of the importance of giving in a substantial and sacrificial way, that we're supposed to give a gift that's, that's big enough that we're going to miss it, that we're going to notice that we don't have it anymore, but that's also big enough to make a, a meaningful difference in the world around us. As a member of a faith community, I give the majority of my offerings to UPC because I believe that the local church is God's primary vehicle of bringing God's kingdom here to this world. But I also give to local nonprofits and missionaries that are near and dear to my heart because I know that the local church can't do everything. For me, I really like the convenience of, of auto pay. 
either through the church website or through the bank because it means it's harder for me to accidentally spend that money if I, if I don't really need it. But there have been periods in my life, and I know a lot of people really like the, the physical act of writing a check each week, and that that can be a blessing as well. For me, it's a spiritual discipline that's grown over time. I remember starting in college giving um, $10 a week, which felt like a lot to a college student. I mean, that was two hours of work each week out of my schedule. And I've increased that every year with Aaron until it felt substantial and faithful. And this practice of, of thoughtfully and consistently giving away a part of what I have has helped me loosen this tie that money has on me. It reminds me that I'm a part of something bigger than myself and that God is with me in this. I was working on my taxes this past week and collecting my, my donation histories for the year, and I remember, I remember looking at it and being like, wow, that was a lot of money. I, I could have done something with that. And then this overwhelming sense of gratitude that I did do something with that money, and I, I didn't miss it, that I was able to make a substantial difference in the world around me, and that God could help me do that. I have such gratitude and joy in being able to participate in building God's kingdom and caring not only about myself and my family, but my neighbors and their families as well. The story of the rich young ruler is written in such a way to grab our attention and to warn us of the unique grasp that money can have on our hearts and to remind us that we exist not only for ourselves and for our family's sake, but for the sake of our neighbor. The man in our scripture today loves God. He's a morally righteous person, but he's unable to shake this, this power that money has over him. And it kept him from experiencing the abundance of life that, that God desired for him and that he knew was missing from his life. Our story today ends with this beautiful promise. It says that those who are able to trust God and pour themselves out for the sake of their neighbor will receive a hundred times more, not just when we die, but right here and right now as well. This call to generosity isn't a call to an empty and sparse life, but of one of great abundance. One author puts it beautifully. He says that God does not intend that we live solitary, empty lives. Discipleship involves discovering a new family and a rich life within the community of those who have been grasped the grace of God and have learned the joy of spending themselves on others. In calling us to give everything to follow Jesus, we aren't being called to a life of scarcity, but we are called to true abundance, where we know God intimately and gracefully, and we can experience the fullness of life that we so desperately long for. Amen.
going on in the life of our community, and so I want to share some of those things with you before we enter a time of prayer together. Um, first of all, it's Betty Boos's 95th birthday, so we celebrate with you, and the flowers back here are for you. Um, that is so wonderful. Um, we also are celebrating today Gianna, baby Gianna, who is Simeon and Elnora's new grandbaby, and this rosebud is in her honor. And we're also um, celebrating today uh, the Orr, Trish and James Orr's baby girl, um, whose name is Nora Ann. She was born on Thursday, and they are doing great. I want to share with you a few other things, too. Um, today we'll pray for Don and Sue Vinegar. Um, Don was at St. Agnes last week with some declining health, and he was placed in a memory care unit. So we are praying for wisdom and strength for Sue as she navigates this time, and also, of course, for Dawn. And we pray for Kathy Walker, um, who's also been having some ongoing heart issues, and um, she is in need of a six-week course of antibiotics to fight off infection that she's experiencing. Um, and of course, today, we pray for Ukraine um, and countries at war and people being impacted by violence. Um, and we pray for Gabrielle Wolf. Um, who is um, Koji's mother, and um, we hold her in prayer as she is um, in Europe right now, um, deployed there. Um, I'm, gonna in, I'm going to do a prayer to begin, um, and then we'll conclude that prayer, and then I want to invite all of you to participate uh, in the prayer, uh, in a second prayer that I'll do. Um, I'm reminded that the role of the people who stand up front is not to do the praying and the worshiping for you, um, but it's to lead you in prayer. You are all praying. Um, you sitting in this room, you watching online, you are the ones praying. And so I'd like to lead us in, a, in an interactive space. Um, but let's begin, um, let's begin in prayer. God of grace and joy, we thank you today for new life for health, for laughter, for the big mir miracles of birth, for all the families connected to this congregation who are celebrating the births of new babies, and for Gianna and Nora especially. We thank you for sleep, for the joy of getting to meet a grandbaby, a daughter, a sister for the first time. These are such beautiful moments. And we thank you for the celebration of life's beautifully lived, for all those celebrating birthdays here in this room. We thank you for the lives of people we love. We love getting to love them. And we pray also now for your grace in the lives of those who are ill and for their caregivers, for Don and Sue and for Kathy and for many more people. 
be with them. Give them wisdom. Give them strength. Be a comfort. We thank you for your good work. God of justice, we find ourselves, our world, here again. War. When bodies are broken, so are our hearts. When communities in one place are torn apart, so is our world. You came to bring death, not you came to bring life, not death. So now that we are here, help us not just to react, but to act from our grounding and the surety of your love. While we are here, help us not to go numb, but to hear the cries of your children in pain. While we are here, help us not to be overwhelmed by all there is to do in the world. Today we pray, and we trust that you will show us how to act. While we may have fear about war, we know that we are not in this world alone. You are here too, and we trust in your spirit to bring peace. Amen. Um, church, there are some candles over here, and in just a moment I'm going to, well, I'll do it right now, um, I'll light the first candle, and I'm going to continue in prayer, and I invite you to come up and to light a candle as a sign of your prayer for peace. And all you have to do is pick up one of these and connect it to this to light a candle. Um, and I expect and trust that all of these will be lit by the time we conclude in prayer. There are 16 of them, so that means 16 of you need to move your bodies in prayer. <laughs> uh, that was really funny. I didn't realize that would be so funny. You guys can light candles too if you want. I invite you to come forward and continue in prayer while I speak some more words. Go ahead. We pray for Ukraine. Peace. Kiev, priests, peace. The people who live in these cities, peace. We pray for those led into war, peace. For everyone impacted by violence, peace. For the first responders to violence, peace. For politicians in power, Peace. And the people that they lead. Peace. We pray for Russia. Peace. For Europe. Peace. For every nation across the globe. Peace. We pray for those fighting for peace. Peace. For the hearts of those in this room who are worried and afraid. Peace. Let's join together now in praying for God's kingdom to come. And I remind you that God's kingdom is a kingdom of peace. So we join our voices together in prayer, and there are two more candles that need to be lit while we do this. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, church, for joining your voices and your bodies in prayer with people all over the world, and especially those in Ukraine. I love how um, Ren said in her sermon that 
um, gifts in one particular community make a substantial difference, and they do. The way that we offer our lives in this community makes a substantial difference in the world and a difference in the lives of the people that we are connected to. Um, and four meal trains is a lot going at once. <laughs> But I can tell you that I have heard personally from people on the receiving end of those that they do make a substantial difference. This community is committed to caring for the world and also for the individuals connected to this place. And that is such a beautiful thing. However you feel called to give, there's so many ways to participate in the life of this church. We pray, we sing, we also serve, we also give of our finances. You can do that in a couple ways, through the boxes at the back of the church or online at upcfresno.org slash give. But the work that we do makes a difference, and we are so thankful that we get to participate in it. I want to invite you now to stand, and let's say our prayer of offering to God, offering our lives to, get to God. Please stand. Holy God, we offer you these gifts with thanks so that together we may water the seeds of your new world. May we be your faithful servants as we cultivate your love, knowing that in all we accomplish, it is you who gives the growth. Amen.
Friends, it is so good to be in worship with you today. Thank you for being here and adding your voice in prayer and all that you are doing to bring God's kingdom of abundance and peace here and now. You are welcome to linger in this space and be the people of God. And as we go out to whatever this week holds, receive God's blessing for you today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.